Welcome to another episode of Raise Your Average. We've got an absolutely great guest and great show for you today. Mike Philbrick and Adam Butler from Resolve Asset Management are here. Joining us today is Bloomberg's Eric Belchunas to talk about all things ETFs and his latest book, The Bogle Effect, how John Bogle and Vanguard turned Wall Street inside out and saved investors trillions. Eric is the senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg. He's also the host of Trillions, one of the most popular podcasts where he and Joel Weber, editor of Bloomberg Business Week, demystify and delight on the subject of how ETFs are transforming investing. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of advisoranalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Eric, welcome and thank you so much for joining us on Raise Your Average. It's great to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Eric, by now, pretty much everyone in the investing world knows who you are. But just in case, tell us about your background, uh, the arc of your career how you came to be the senior analyst on ETFs at Bloomberg. Yeah, it was not a straight path. Um, I, uh, I did in college write for the school paper uh, at Rutgers. And so I got into journalism, majored in journalism. Didn't really know what I wanted to do, but that's why I, I was like, yeah, I like this enough. Um, minor in economics. And so naturally getting, I actually applied to Bloomberg right out of college, but they didn't take me. So I got a job at institutional investor. And then after that, um, I went to work on in, in on the PR side. I was getting fed all these like PR people like seemed to be behind the keyhole. And I was just like curious. So I went to work at a PR firm and and then um I did that for a couple of years and then I joined Bloomberg's PR and then right around nine eleven, right after that, I moved to South Jersey, ended up transferring to our data office in Princeton, and that's all they did there. So was it really an ideal show? I mean, I didn't it just stumbled into that to be honest. I spent 12 years in data. Um, so I actually found myself uh, adding value there as somebody who could talk and write around the data. And so I started talking and writing about ETFs in 2008. I was assigned them and I was like, wow, these things are pretty good. Like they're, this is a really uh, good vehicle. I should learn more about these. So I just sort of uh, own that topic around here. And, and then I got recruited by our research group. Um, and so I like to say now I kind of do all three. I do their data. <laughs> And then I do the writing and then I have to, you have to do PR for yourself these days. So, so I do that. Um, and so I kind of use all three jobs in this one, but my job now is as a senior ETF analyst for our research department, which is like basically like 350 people and most of them do stocks and bonds. And so there's a couple of people who do other stuff and I'm in my small team of uh, five people do the other stuff. Um, in our case, it's ETFs, but we have some ESG people, we have some macro people. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do research. And so that's it. That's what I, that's, that's my story. <laughs> is it only ETFs or is it all sort of all ETPs? So do you do, um, yeah, exchange traded, like credit oriented stuff and like, um, oh yeah, stuff or yeah, yeah. Okay. Exotic stuff. Yeah. yeah. We like the exotic, it gets a lot of reads. People like to read about broken ETNs and stuff. So we definitely cover everything. Um, even in Europe, they got some crazy stuff over there. And so, yeah, there's like yeah. triple leverage nickel ETN in Europe that just closed. And so we'll cover anything. Um, that's one of the reasons I like covering ETFs is that I have a short attention span. And they, this, they send you all over the place because you cover ETFs, you kind of have to cover everything because at, at this point they track everything. So, um, yeah, we're, we actually enjoy the fact that it's everything. Um, but we made this like traffic light system, which is like movie, movie ratings for ETFs so that people who are maybe more retail just steer towards the green light products. The yellow light's like, well, maybe read a little more of the fine print. And then the red light's like, unless you know what you're doing, like stay away from these. So because of all the big tent has all these different products, we, we created a system specifically to address the um, wild and crazy sections of the ETF market. Because they're, they're, they're not all ETFs um, and they're not all normal and they have a nasty surprise potential in cases. So yeah. Um, we cover everything. I'm actually kind of fascinated with some of the drama that's happening with one of the largest <laughs> ETN issuers at the moment. I wonder if you sure. could just sort of bring us up to speed yeah. on this because it's a really fascinating story. So yeah, they um, Barclays halted creations on VXX, which is the legendary VIX ET 
N. And um, this thing's had a really just long life of it's the whole VIX ETP category is is just got a history of just weird stuff going on. Um, obviously, that would get a red light. But anyway, they halted creations, which basically breaks an ETF. It turns an ETF into a closed end fund because you now cannot do arbitrage. So basically, the price would just do what it does. And the NAV is just would it, the NAV is calculated based on the futures. But the ETF doesn't necessarily have to, because nobody can now sell that and buy this to close that because you cannot do new creations. So when you haul creations, you essentially rip the heart out of an ETF and why people love it. So I, I hate when they do that. They did this. Apparently, it was part of a structured note. Um, uh, they had to register for a certain amount of issuance of, of many structured notes, not just VXX, which is a note, by the way. Um, and I guess they they... Put in for five billion, but they sold twenty. <laughs> so somebody, somebody done messed up. Um, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in that conversation, but that's what happened. And so there was like a almost like a clerical clerical error. Somebody on Twitter has theorized that they do that on purpose, just in case the market moves a certain direction. I don't know, but uh, apparently they had to pay everybody back a par, which was not good. So they lost four hundred fifty million dollars in this situation. The, I, the guy was speculating that if you do this correctly, you actually pay people back at par and you make money or something. I don't know. That's a bit, that's a bit next level conspiracy, but I well, think it sounds like a clerical error and just the somebody screwed up and the, uh, the ETF and the, the VXX has another component. People love to short it because when you're short VXX, you get to uh, get the premium from selling VIX futures, which is, can be really good. Obviously you, it sucks. It's like selling insurance. It sucks when the VIX goes up, but if it doesn't, it can really be a nice like dollar bill in front of a steamroller type deal. And 50% of the shares were short. So when they halted creations, everybody's like freaking out because they're like, I got to cut my short. So it, it made the price zoom up. So it's all kinds of messed up right now. So nobody really even knows what it's worth, but it's trading like 25% over the actual value of it. Um, so this, you hate to see it. I don't like it. I, I bashed Barclays in a note. And uh, you know, that's why, but I, I did say that's why it's it's in the red light category the red light district if you will All right anything that rolls futures is red yeah. light yeah. um let alone it's an etn and it's vix so it's got like all kinds of stuff but just rolling futures alone to me is can be complicated to regular people so we give all those reds well and, it, gotcha. and, and you have precedent for the reds whether it's things that happen in the oil markets or vix or wherever it's it's a challenging area to Try and roll futures and tell everybody exactly how you're going to roll them all the time, too. That's a front-running issue that happens. So Absolutely, it's... yeah. And I just learned they're coming out with uh, uh, Wednesday. They've got two new, exactly like XIV and TVIX products coming out, but they're going to be ETFs, but they're going to be front and second month futures. So this is the, this is the juice. This is what people like. Because some of the products uh, kind of, I call it, new, they got neutered. Like um, UVXY is now only half exposed but these are these coming out are like really like they're just like xiv and tvix except they will have be actively managed and have more flexibility around the rebalance i won't go into the details but that should stop a total blow up or termination issue but that mm -hmm. that won't stop the fact that this these things could be volatile and, and wild and again the auto, this would automatically be red light but they're launching on wednesday for anybody who is into that kind so, of thing are these the volatility <laughs> shares yes right you yeah. know them Yes, you should so have that guy. Stuart, on. Stuart Barton, right? We yeah. have we have him on Friday. Actually, he's coming on riffs. Oh, perfect! <clears throat> yeah, you got I it. Mean, this is he's here on yes. Island, so we've had him come to we a few events. He has and all that resurrected stuff. XIV. I, yeah. some, look, if you go to Twitter and you put hashtag XIV, people miss this thing. There, there's people who generally still tweet about it. They miss it, um, even though it got a lot of flack for blowing up and whatever. Um, it's interesting. I looked at the total money um, XIV took in versus the assets it had at the end. It made more money for people than it lost. People were pulling money out as it went up, which you should do. So over yep, its life, yep. it actually generated more profits, even with the blow up at the end when it went down 90% in like a day, which is epic. <laughs> yeah, we always say that if you're going to use these types of products in the portfolio, they need to be used as a niche product. We always say if you're going to hold um, you know, these short VIX ETNs or ETFs in your portfolio, they should be held at a small or target exposure, and you should maintain that target exposure so they're going to grow in size as they continue to generate returns on that roll yield on rolling down the VIX. But, 
you need to then actively manage that by, by selling units and redeploying them to the other parts of the portfolio so that you're maintaining that target exposure. If you're going to, if you're going to toy with these at all, which, you know, we probably shouldn't recommend it just to anybody, but, um, and none of this is advice, I guess I should probably say that, but there's, um, there's a product that, that they closed along with XIV that we actually thought was a better way to do this, which is ZIV, which was shorting the middle of the curve because yes. even in the, the volume again, and it didn't, it didn't, it went down, I think it went down like 40, 50%, which sounds horrible, but it survived it. It went back. It was, it's almost like low vol inverse VIX, but nobody cared. Um, people want the juice when it comes to this stuff. They want the, as close to the flame as you can get it. Same thing happened with USO. That was a front month oil future ETF uh, that had to move to all parts of the curve. Nobody cares. The crowd that likes these likes juice. They want quick hits. They want, you know, it's like, it's pure gambling kind of crowd. And so I, but ultimately for a portfolio, I, I thought ZIV wasn't a bad allocation in a small chunk and you could almost yeah. set it and forget that one, but I might get email yeah. for that. But yeah, we, we, that was anyway, um, people want the juice. That's just the way it is. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's, we, we don't have all day today. Yeah. So let's also jump into the topic of, of the day, I suppose. So, well, that was the topic of the day, but the longer term topic of the day, your new book and the Bogle effect. And, and maybe just give everybody a sense of, of how you came to write it. Uh, you know, some of the people you talk to kind of wander through for us, the culmination of the idea you had some of this on the shelf and you're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I gotta get this in print and, and, uh, and share this with the world. So take, take us through that story. Yeah. Um, I had sat down with Bogle three times for over an hour each, and I recorded every interview. And it was in the five years before he passed away. So in the last interview in particular was about six months before he passed away. And I remember leaving that interview saying, thinking, man, he, he really just went far into the future. I mean, he was as, and he also had some, um, he, uh, what was the word I'm looking for? He had more compromise than he had in the past. Like, and so I had some new data on his being softer on ETFs. He's always been nasty about ETFs. And I had him talking about the future and where he thinks things are going. And um, so I, I took four hours of the dictaphone interviews and I was like, you know, um, I had a chance to hang out with this guy. He had a huge impact. I see the data, I track fund flows. I'm like, man, so much of the data, the flows are because of what this dude did back in the seventies. And so I wanted to sort of trace the data and then pepper in the interview. And then I also realized that because Vanguard has started to get into the advisory world, that that's a whole interesting issue to me is the advisory world is sort of beginning to feel the Vanguard effect. The funds world is feeling it now or felt it. And now there's the advisory world. There's also the platform trading. Van Vanguard went commission free before anybody else and everybody followed. Um, and I really started to realize that this guy and the structure, the mutual ownership structure to me is the real change agent. Indexing was merely a byproduct. I think Indexing needed Vanguard and its low fees more than Vanguard actually needed indexing. They were a perfect match once they matched up, but an 80 basis point index fund is just not going to really sweep the nation. A five basis point index fund is. And so it was this idea of why, how, how come nobody's copied that structure? Uh, well, there's no economic incentive. Well, then why did he do it? And I just had, there was a lot of questions I had, and I thought I had an opportunity just to like try to capture this moment, capture his personality, and just leave it out there for posterity. Um, and I, I wasn't sure I would be the right guy to write this book, but I went to a tribute event for him that Women in ETF asked me to speak at. And I, get, I had a PowerPoint of my favorite quotes from those interviews. And the audience was like, Gus Souter was there. He's a former CIO of Vanguard. And like his assistant, Mike Nolan, people who knew him well. And the reaction was good. People were like, you really captured his vibe or whatever. And I was like, <clears throat> all right, maybe, maybe I could write this. Because I, I can't say I've been covering Vanguard since like the eighties or nineties, like uh, some people have. Um, but I guess I, I had the confidence then to do it. And then I, to help because I am not the smartest guy, <laughs> my move is to interview smart people. So I interviewed 50 people to help, uh, fill in gaps, uh, in his life and in the data and with speculation about where the industry is. And so I interviewed people, I, um, some pretty big names like Buffett. Um, he replied to my email, which I was surprised pretty quickly too. Um, well, Michael Lewis, Cliff Asnes, 
um, Kathy Wood. Yep. I, I wanted to get people who might not have known him and, and or who are active. Um, and then I got people like Gus Souter and uh, Jack Norris, who was the head of Vanguard International for a long time. I couldn't get anybody currently at Vanguard. They were a little, I don't know, they weren't really forthcoming. They helped me with data, but not that. Um, and then I interviewed, um, you know, people like Jason Zweig of the Wall Street Journal. He was really good. I interviewed Bogle's son. Um, but that's it. I didn't go, I didn't interview his wife or anything. I, I didn't, little chunks of Bogle at home, but mostly it's, mostly it's just basically like, it's a chapter on how Vanguard got started. Then there's a chapter on why selling the index fund wasn't that easy. To sell average in the 70s and 80s, especially when you're outside of the system, you know, you're not paying any brokers. It's not easy. A, people think I don't want average and B, you're not paying a broker. So who could even hear about it? And there's no internet. So I was interested. Yep. I looked at all the ways he was able to try to sell indexing. He had to get really creative. Um, and there's a chapter on, um, I try to break down the, the elements that went into him, like his Great Depression upbringing, his heart. He was supposed to die, like, you know, at age 30. He had a bad heart. Um, and I try to just sort of fill in, like, how this, this freak of, not freak, force of nature guy happened and this sort of quirky situation where somebody launches a fund company where they turn over all the profits to the funds and the investors. That makes no sense. Um, and then I look at um, the, the, how I call it the fall and rise of active. I look at how active closet indexing, high cost active is probably going to slowly, sl you know, over time go extinct, but that there's all new forms of acting rising up that are largely ways to complement uh, cheap beta as opposed to compete with it. And uh, I thought that's a chapter I write about all the time. That was easy. Like, and then um, you know, I looked at things like um, the uh, advisory world. I looked at uh, behavior. I think he had an impact on behavior and like all that, you know, uh, not taking the bait and, you know, the media is, makes you want to trade. Don't listen. You know, there was a lot of stuff to uh, pull apart there. I went into the Robin Hood thing um, and just sort of tried to get his, his voice on, on behavior. And then there's actually a chapter on him versus Vanguard because what I found interesting about him was that he was kicked out of both of the companies he like ran and loved. And I thought it was interesting. This sort of St. Jack figure was so hard to work with that he got booted from his two companies against his will. And uh, so in the Vanguard case, that meant that for the 25 years since he was CEO, he would sit in this office and constantly dump on some of the products they had and the people, I mean, he was very cantankerous and um, I wanted to explore that because I think he was really rigid and really Puritan and Vanguard, the company's a little more chill. They, they will go into some areas that might not be Bogley and, and that started to get a gap, especially when they went to ETFs. And so that gap I explore a little bit too. So I, the reason I, I, I wanted to sort of capture um, a lot of this because I feel like we're at this moment of time where um, this, it's almost like Amazon and retail, like this company really has had a profound effect. And if you're an investor, it's interesting to read about it. Um, I, go, I look at some of the funds. I don't go too much into how to investing. It's not as much that story. Um, and then if you're in the industry, I think it's a good way to sort of, um, it's a good, I think you'll find some nuggets there that are interesting and ways to plan around it and whatnot. So I try to write it for both a regular retail investor and someone in the industry. I, whether I succeed, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think um, I think you have. And, and can you elaborate a little bit on that emergent phenomenon that's so unique that really caused or forced the creation of this unique set of circumstances for Bogle, Vanguard, the structure of the funds, the chairmanship and ownership of the funds and the relationship? Because I really find that a fascinating story of of just this, this cavalcade of stuff that happened to set in, in motion, this emergent phenomenon without which none of this may have happened. Yeah. I mean, at the end, I didn't realize some of that. I dove deep into this and there were three major serendipitous situations where it was almost like a 100,000 to one shot thing happening three times. And I thought, man, it almost feels like yep. fate was wanted this to happen because the first one was he's looking for a thesis to write. In, at Princeton. So he's just going to the library and he's paging through magazines and he finds fortune and there's an article on mutual funds in Boston there. Um, but like I looked at the Time Magazine that month and it was uh, Conrad Hilton. And I was like, what if you pick that one up? What he have written about the hotel business, <laughs> you know? Um, so 
that's lucky. Just that's how he decided to get into mutual funds. Picked up a magazine. <laughs> so then he goes to get to Wellington. Does great, but they have problems because they're selling a balance fund in the go-go 60s, and everybody's going to the growth funds. It reminds me of like the Ark. Everybody was going to like the Ark type growth funds, and he was selling like balanced, and nobody cared. And he said, "I was selling bagels, and everybody wanted donuts." So he teamed up with this <laughs> um, company called Thorndike. And they had a growth fund, like an ARC fund. And for a year or two, it worked well. But they ultimately um, turned the Wellington fund into almost all equity. And then obviously the 70s hit and things got bad. And the Wellington fund went down the same as the market. And, you know, he this was the, his baby. And then his boss left the whole company in his care. He gave the Thorndike people voting control. They got into a fight. Everybody was upset, bear market. And so the Wellington people kicked him out. They said, you're fired. You got to get out of here. From his own, you know, from Wellington. And they didn't realize, though, because they weren't mutual fund people, that he was still the chairman of the 11 funds. And as you know, from mutual fund is like a shell company, and you can fire and hire the administrator, the investment advisor. So he had some leverage all of a sudden, and he gets into this bifurcation period, is how they put it. And there was a stalemate between the two. <clears throat> and so the board of the fund said, we got to have a solution. And so the uh, they went and he came up with like some ideas. And the only way to get it through the fund board, because there was three, three um, Thorndike people on it and like eight, like sort of Wellington friends, but he still had the three people on there. So to get it through, he said, how about this? I'll run a back office company. I'll do the administration transfer agency, the boring stuff that you don't want to do because you guys like investing. We'll hire, we'll hire you as the investor. So you're still going to do what you love. And by the way, it'll be mutually owned. And that way, it's not like me looking for some payday or some, some thing. So it was a way to get it past the board, save his job. That said, he had said he thought about this uh, mutual concept in college. I can't tell whether that's true. There's a lot of – Vogel kind of rewrote history a little bit. But I think the saving his job was the ultimate priority here. And by being mutual, it, it showed them that he wasn't doing anything for his own profit. And that allowed the people to all vote unanimously that you can do this. And that back office company was Vanguard. And so you could see that that's unheard of. It rarely do you have an investment advisor fighting with the funds like this. Um, it's and what's interesting is when he went out to search for a partner to be the equity um, partner, Thorndike was like the fifth on his list. He went to Capital Group, Franklin Funds. And he was friendly with those guys. And I think that if he had gone with Capital, they probably would have worked together better. Um, or Franklin just happened to pick this one company where, you know, they were just very aggressive and they didn't know them that well. And I also wonder what if the bear market in the seventies wasn't that bad? I mean, you could see the amount of things that have to go to, and like who would, how many, how many situations do you have where the, a board of a company can actually not get rid of you because you own the funds? Like that's also weird. So all it's, you know, it, and then obviously after the company formed, he gets the idea for indexing from a journal. Again, reading reading um, reading journals and magazines is like half his. That's how where half his ideas came from. And the when he set up the arrangement with Vanguard, he said, "I won't manage money," which is one reason they signed off on it. He said, "Well, if I launch an index fund, it's not actually running money." So they called the first PM a portfolio administrator, and that also was a quirky, serendipitous event because he he wasn't allowed to run money, but he was somehow able to get the board to buy it that he wasn't. So if you see those three things are really weird in, in a row, and there's a couple of things, but I think those are the three main ones where you read it and you're like, it, it's just so weird. It's not like he like came out of college saying, I'm going to change the world. With it, it all kind of circumstance was huge in this situation. Yeah. I mean, in, in all three cases, he was solving a problem, right? He was, he was solving a problem so that things went his way. But I mean, his way turned out to be you know, like you said, a convergence of, of these three sort of serendipitous decisions and moments. I will say that that are just the it's wild. Yeah, I mean, the idea of turning over the profits to the funds and the investors. I you you could say okay, well, he did this to save his job in the time being. Maybe he converts back to a for profit LP or something, or maybe he just says, you know, enough with this. I have six small kids. I, I've got to I got to make more money. I'll go to Goldman. I mean, there were several times I think he could have just abandon this but he really once he locked in on this concept of like wait this structure is going to change things and um we can make low cost investing a thing and um that's where i think he deserves some credit for 
for actually seeing it through because I did read all the speeches in early, the early years from the 80s and 90s, and it's fascinating how laser focused he is on costs. Even like, you know, in the 80s, nobody was really that concerned about cost. I mean, it was a Wall Street, you know, like the movie Wall. I, I actually compare the movie Wall Street. The same month it came out, he gives a Christmas party speech. And you're just like, they were too far apart worlds. The world eventually turned and costs are a big deal now. But for decades, he was just out of step. Um, and I think that vision deserves some credit and the follow through. And the idea that you can actually build a company, manage people. A lot of people who are idealists or have an, you know, um, maybe have a circumstance that's good for them. Maybe they can't manage or hire well. Um, so there was a lot of, it had to go into this. Um, and that's why it's, I think, worth study. And I think there's a good business story in there too. Um, and I think he was probably, if anything, I think one of the takeaways is, you know, make sure to treat your, your clients and customers well. Like if you get it, you know, maybe share a little of the profits with them or you know, not, Vanguard went really crazy with that. But I think there's probably some lessons in there because they built up a lot of trust and goodwill. I think over those decades when nobody cared and now they're like solid, right? I mean, you, they can't, they can't keep the money away. Yeah. Um, so I, I think he, he was onto mm -hmm. something, but he could also be really rigid and, and annoying to people. <laughs> I mean, it was, he, you know, they, um, one time his assistants brought him a, bought him a priest collar at this annual, uh, former <laughs> assistant party he used to have. And they said, look, if you're going <laughs> to act like this, you might as well look the part. Oh, Oh, that is awesome. That's cheeky. That is, that is a bit cheeky, isn't it? Is it? Is that maybe why no one else duplicated him for so long? I mean, is that why uh, no one bothered to, to mimic this um, for so many decades in the initial sort of ramping up? You mean the structure? So well, I, just I, just this dogged determination on costs as a as a, a medium of 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 a better outcome. I just think, mo like, I know in the book, I I have a chapter trying to explain how mutual funds were just so utterly disrupted by this guy. And one of my premises is that they didn't share any of the dollar fees, which grew crazy, especially in the '90s. They were, you know, charging one percent when you have a small amount of assets. I think is understandable because it dollar wise, it's not that much. But when you have 30, 50, 60, 200 billion, a trillion, your 90 basis points is just, I mean, you're just, the gravy's flowing all over. And I think these companies could have done themselves a favor by sharing just a little bit. Um, but I, you know, that's human nature. And in the book I write, like, I, I would have done the same thing. I probably would have used the money to sponsor a sports stadium, hire a bunch of people, do the better Christmas party. I think most, that's just human nature, especially maybe if, uh, people going to Wall Street want to make money. He, he's just unusual. That's why, you know, he's worth the study. But I just think that's that's why nobody's done it. Um, but yeah. the structure itself, there's just no economic incentive to do that. And if you're looking to set up an asset manager, I don't know, no, I, I, you wouldn't get any like, I, I don't know. It it just, it's kind of hard to for, to give up all the future profits. Um, you know, he made, he did fine. I think also there's a lesson here of like, you can have a company and have pretty good salaries, but if the, you could still, it's, it's the ownership where people get filthy rich. Like Abigail Johnson is worth, I think 16 billion. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, the, I, I, her salary is probably what a couple million or something. The same thing with Vanguard. They get paid well, but no, there's no ownership yeah. explosion of tens of billions. That's the difference. Um, I think with that and somebody who's going to work, 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, probably isn't interested in turning all that over. I know I wouldn't be. Although I will say what I talk about in the book is now a lot of people have to, especially the mid and bigger companies. I think the small guys are probably in good shape. They have local relationships. They're doing usually unique things. But the big, gigantic legacy mutual fund companies, they all now have to sell five basis point index funds or ETFs. Look, at Fidelity has free index funds. That's almost all, like, all their flows are there. So in a way, the mutual fund structure, it might not be something they use, but they're almost governed by it at this point. So what was the, uh, what was the reason he was so opposed to ETFs? He, he thought um, ETFs just would tempt you to trade. You know, they're on an exchange and the turnover numbers were really high. And he, you know, he just, he looked at investing like planting a tree. You know, you just, you, you, you have to wait. And the only way to enjoy compound interest is to keep your hands off the damn thing. And so 
he was real into that. And he makes sense if you show compound enders. It's awesome what starts to happen. Um, and an ETF would hurt that, you know. He just thought that it was, there was no point in making funds trade. Um, but I will say even his uh, closest admir admirers and friends disagreed with him. They thought the ETF did, uh, it made indexing more accessible. You know, it, it, it distributed indexing more. And you can not trade if you want. I talked to a lot of advisors who were like, I'm, just, I'm not tempted to trade. Um, that said, there are studies that if you look at, a, uh, say, at Fidelity or any account where they have ETFs and mutual funds, the ETFs tend to have shorter holding periods. So he, I think he, the data backs right. him up a little. But that doesn't mean that some people aren't holding it long term. Some of the big institutional traders, I think, skew the, the trading numbers a little. So my metaphor for an ETF is like a hotel, bustling lobby, but there's plenty of people like up in their rooms just quietly chilling out. And the two don't bother, you know, they, they can all live there. Uh, it's no problem. Um, and I think he focused in the lobby a little too much, but that's just my, <laughs> like I said, at the beginning of the book, I'm like, look, this guy was pretty savage and pretty critical of everything in the financial world. So if you're in that industry, you know, you're, you may feel judged and I made sure to point out that I'm in ETFs and. He was, he was probably especially brutal towards my world, but I also can respect his view and then sort of point out these other things. Um, the other thing he didn't like about ETS was the marketing. He thought they just got too crazy. And like when he came on our, our show, he thought um, he brought like the whiskey ETF. <laughs> that one in particular drove him crazy. Um, and the, uh, he called it all like <laughs> nutcases in the lunatic fringe. And so he saw these different products and in the, in one of his last books, he, said he felt like Dr. Frankenstein, like what have I created uh, with the idea of the index fund being mutated and changed so much that he, he didn't like the gimmickry and marketing of it. Um, so trading and marketing were the two things he didn't like. It's hard to argue with him on those, but I think he might have cast, he may have painted with too broad a brush on the whole industry. Um, but I think he softened a little towards the end. I saw it each interview as went on. The last one, he was the more, he was as, as conciliatory as I've ever seen him. What do you think was behind the, you know, becoming more conciliatory? Um, two things. One, I think, um, you know, I think, I don't know if people sense it's late in the day, life-wise, and they just start to melt a little more. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Um, but in our last interview, he said, you know, I, I probably would have done the same thing. And I know he didn't totally mean it, but I could just see him getting more chill. Other thing was um, when Gus Souter pushed for ETFs at Vanguard in two, year 2000. And because Bogle had said no to Nate Most in 1993, the first ETF could have been launched by Vanguard in 93. Imagine how big they'd be. Um, Bogle said no. And then when Jack Brennan took over, he allowed Gus Souter to look at the, into this project. Gus said this is the reason he wanted to do it was to protect the index mutual fund investors from short-term traders. So that way people weren't diving in and out of the index fund and causing costs. They could just use the ETF share class or an ETF. And that was his, that's what Gus Souter told me his goal was, not distribution. Bogle seemed to think it was distribution for more and more and more. And Gus said he caught up with Bogle in 2014-ish and told him that. And he thought he didn't really know that. And I think maybe that helped was that just knowing that the core of the need was to actually protect the fund investors, not to get another trillion dollars. But I'm not, that's just my sort of general speculation on that. But, um, uh, <laughs> and I think, I think sometimes people would, uh, like Rick Ferry and stuff who hang out with him, they would try to explain to him like that, you know, hey, look, Vanguard ETFs don't trade a lot. Schwab ETFs don't, like, it's your, there are sections, the ETFs are big tent. There are sections that are real calm. It's like the zoo. You know, there's the calm animals, no biggie. And then there's the crazy stuff. And I just think he, like when I saw him, he would take out printouts of like, um, like the oil ETF, and he'd be like, look at this, and he'd show flow-weighted returns. ARC would have driven him crazy, I think. I think he would have seen the um, asset-weighted <laughs> returns on that, and he hated that. Yeah. He hated dollar-weighted returns. And, and But I said to him, like, USO, like, I don't think anybody's going in long-term, but he would show the data and say that um, this thing has lost, like, a billion dollars in the past four years. And I guess, you know, based on that data, he's right, but I, I, I think... The, like the Vanguard ETF, VTI, he'd have a whole different data. That thing would not have the same thing. So he would apply anti-ETF by using 
really extreme examples, I think, sometimes. Maybe that's one of my pushbacks. But SPY, which is, I would say, a vanilla ETF, he would say, that thing trades four, it turns over 4,000% a year. He's like, I, you know, and you're, I, I think 3% is pushing the envelope. So he, he just, it was like, I don't know, like, I don't know. He, he, and he also saw the New York Stock Exchange trading increase since the 50s. And so it was all part of this, like, what's happening? So he wrote one book called Clash of the Cultures, which was about that. And so it wasn't just ETFs. He just, you know how you get when you get old. Every, all the new stuff's like, Arr. I think there was a little of that, and like, get off my lawn, you know. But I, I put it all out there just to <laughs> so somebody, and I, and I have the, the other voices come in who push back, and I'm a little bit pushing back on the ETF. But I, I leave his stuff in there, and I try to let people just be their own jury on where they fall but uh, you know I, I try to be fair i try to it's net positive on him but i try to show you know some of the places where people disagree with him like international he wasn't international but most people disagree with him on that um so there was definitely um some some areas where uh, you know again even his closest colleagues like i just don't agree with him i mean he was a man alone in, in some of those cases yeah. and i used to have this PowerPoint <clears throat> slide I did about five or six years ago where I'd show all the Vanguard categories like Smart Beta, um, International, ETFs, and then I put Bogle's quote trashing all that, and then I show the flows, and I'm like, Vanguard is so in the zone, their 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 flows are Bogle proof, like even this guy who founded the company can't stop the flows with his negative comments, um, but that also shows you that investors aren't all as pure as he is, they they have different needs, they they want to try to do better, maybe they they like to have a little spice. Um, it's okay. Um, he was pretty rigid, though. He was just de definitely like he had the, a little bit of a Puritan kind of vibe. I love that it's uh, that it's you that wrote this book. You're from the ETF world, and you've taken, taken upon yourself to write about John Bogle that he was sort of the anti-ETF guy. Coming from you, it's coming from um, somebody who's actually objective about yeah, I, not I only think so. ETFs and but mutual funds as well. I, I think the low cost thing is great, but I um, also am acknowledging that, you know, there's different ways to do it. And in fact, even um, his son, John Bogle Jr. is an active manager, which yeah. is pretty cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> just, that just, that just no, flies he, yeah, in the face of dad, you know, everything dad cap, believes. Mutual fund. I love um, it. Yeah. So I was curious to hear how you computed that number about how Bogle saved investors trillions. Yeah. So um, look, I, I, it's a pretty blunt take, but it basically looks at the average asset weighted fee of an active mutual fund over the past 45 years, which by the way, went up and up until, until indexing got popular, frankly, in about 2000, then it starts to come down. And then I look at Vanguard's fees that have gone down like this. So there's like the alligator mouth. And I just multiply that difference by the assets in Vanguard each of those years. And then I added a couple other things. I added the Vanguard effect because let's, you know, is Fidelity and BlackRock really launching five basis point funds if Vanguard isn't in the picture? Probably not. So I think he deserves credit for the effect. And then um, that's how I wrote an opinion piece about that. That gets you to about 900 billion or something like that. And um, I wrote an opinion piece that was like that five years ago, kind of trying to trace that out. Oh, there's also turnover. Basically, active mutual funds probably tr have turnover 50%. Vanguard's like, you know, two, three, something like that. So those, that's about 40 bips a year in cost. And so I did the same thing with that multiplication. And then um, he was on TV and somebody asked him about the article and he actually said, well, there's also the, the save money gets reinvested. So I did that for him, even though I said, you know, that's getting a little, uh, maybe, maybe, said, maybe, whatever. I, the whole time I'm trying to like, be like, you know, okay, if we add this, that gets you another like 300 billion. And then I, um, I believe that was it. Um, but I did sort of go forward and I said, look, there's advisors have $26 trillion in assets. Vanguard is really working on disrupting them. And if, if, if they go, if advisors as a whole go from 1% to 30 bips over the next, depends how much assets Vanguard has, they have 260 billion in their advisory business um, at five to 30 bips. And if you extrapolate that, you know, you start to get to some more billions. 
And then it's like, well, they could even go into private equity. I'm not sure they'd be the best private equity fund, but they could at least Walmartize some of that. They have, they partnered up with somebody. The thing is, once you're an advisor, you have to deal with other parts of the market. You can't just be index funds. So they have to have private equity solution. They probably are gonna have to do, you know, think about alts at some point. I will say, I think they're gonna partner more than launch their own. So I think there's probably opportunity for people to partner with them as a, as a solution off the shelf for their advisors. They now have 1,000 certified financial planners there. I think they, they I, um, Aaron from the Philadelphia Inquirer, who I interviewed, I think said something like they have, of all the advisors in the Philadelphia area, they have half. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It'd be wow. a thousand. Uh, it's a lot, right? And so- well, That's incredible. The, as, yeah. as that grows, because it's not just getting new clients. They hardly even need to do that. If you have Vanguard funds, you might just move, you might just, a lot of people who went to Vanguard went there on their own. They skipped advisors, but now they got more going on. They're like, I need help. So that's where they're getting most of their clients from, but that is a massive pool. So even without outsiders, they're going to grow that business and they're going to need stuff off the shelf. You know, the 65 year old who has, I don't know, let's say 35 million, you know, maybe they want private equity or alts to offset some of the stuff going on. So I think once you go in to be an advisor, you're going to have to deal with other parts. And so that was also exciting for the book, which is that this is bigger than indexing. Um, you know, this is this structure being applied to all these different places. And it's, you know, a company with no profit motive is, is dangerous um, and arguably probably good um, net positive. I think it can go too far, but uh, that's, it's not just limited to like an index mutual fund, clearly. How does Jack feel about the advisory business? Yeah, I, I would, he, so uh, when I, when his book, Little Book of Common Sense, which I think is probably his best one, he says, look, um, if, if advisors are out there trying to pick the next hot manager, um, that's probably not going to work out. If they're, if they're in there, like trying to keep your costs low and doing planning, tax work, that's probably worth the money. So he was mixed. Although I did ask him about this, you know, this Rick Ferry debate that's happening on Twitter all the time where he drops these advisor bombs. He'd like just hits the third rail about like their fees and hourly. And I asked him about that in our last interview. And he said, the, the advisor business is going to have to get more professional. The idea that you get paid, I don't know, more than a heart surgeon. Um, because again, they're also getting percentage. And as the assets have creeped up because the 60, 40 is blown up, they get paid a lot of money. And so the hourly model is like, just pay us like you would a lawyer. And it's, it's a lot. It could be three or 400 bucks, which sounds like crazy. But as a percentage of assets, that could be three or 4,000. So the hourly is actually, uh, there's a movement trying to get the hourly going. And I understand it. So Bogle thought they, they'd ultimately move to hourly or fixed rate, fit, you know, just a fixed fee, ultimately. But then I talked to people like Michael Kitsis and he says, mm, I don't think so. I think people, I think there's also people like paying a percentage fee because it just doesn't come out of their checkbook. Um, it's, it just does, don't feel it. But it, if you add up at the end of the year, it's like double if you did hourly. People don't, I don't know. There's something psychological about that. So a lot of advisors, I think are like feeling pretty safe, but I don't know. Um, we'll see if it becomes a thing. I, you know, I try to just lay it all out there and the hourly is still on less than 1% of the whole industry, but the fee based, you know, they used to, you know, the commission base is now down to about a quarter. I think the fee base is up to 71, 72%. And that, that was like 50% 10 years ago. So my, the, my theory is it'll probably go fee base fully at some point, maybe a couple duels. And then maybe next wave, maybe hourly will be a thing. Well, I don't know what, I mean, curious to get your guys thoughts. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, it's a good question. I think that you're, you're right. I think that the, the other thing though, is that these are the types of discussions that you have at the end of a decade long period when 60, 40 has, uh, massively outperformed and there is no differentiation within the advisor group, the dispersion has been minimal. If you're in that area, you've done well, if you've diversified, you've done poorly. So here you have an, a space where if you've done the right thing for a portfolio over 30 to 40 years, i.e. being diversified in international markets, holding a consistent exposure to commodity markets for inflationary impulses, you've drastically underperformed and probably don't have as many clients or as big a book. But you have done, or you have prescribed the right medicine, um, and so it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a dangerous scenario, and um, that ebb and flow will will 
you know, I think the, the challenge is we're in an area where skill is hard to suss out from luck. And then planning gets integrated with the investment decisions. And now you have this weird, you know, planning is largely a, a little bit more skillful. You know, if you're going to think about those tax situations and put some thought in them and do some structuring and think ahead. Well, it's more, yeah. it's, it's easier to identify where the skill, where the right. skill is. Yes. Correct. And so then you have this conflation of, you know, luck or good advice. These are hard things. You know, you pick the best EM manager over the last 10 years, the best one, not top fifth percentile, the best. They don't outperform the bottom fifth percentile in the U.S. equity space. It's not even close. And the, so, the one, th uh, one thing on that, which is, I think it just makes it tough for, for active, although I think there's room for it. Um, I think a lot of advisors have just come to this resignation or conclusion that even if I bought that emerging markets manager, they, they can't persist. Like there's this idea that you, you kill it for 10 years and then, but I, you're likely to be at the bottom of the next. So the idea that persistence, because not just, I think that everybody agrees some people will outperform. I think where advisors run into a resignation, if you will, which is mm. why I think indexing is so popular is they're like, yeah, but it, they might not do it again. And like, and I think they're, it's just, I kind of get it, but um, it, it's like, what is the manager supposed to do? They just, they're supposed to get excess return. They did it. Usually they'll, we'll get some buyers. I mean, usually there are people who will buy into a fund like that, but I think the, that 60, 40 advisor is like over it in many ways. Yeah. And, but yeah, maybe that 60, 40 goes down for 10 years straight. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get have, into a 2000 yeah. to 2014. Yeah. Let's get into yeah. the 1968 You're to right. 1982 environment where stocks and bonds coordinate and are correlated. The efficient frontier is a straight line and you just eat shit all day for 12 years. <laughs> and let's see how, how that goes on. Yeah. on. And, but I'm sure that the Bogleheads will buy through that whole thing. There, there is. You know, as you've stated, the flows came in in 08, yeah. right? The flows just kept coming in on the yeah. Boggle side, on the Vanguard side. So listen, and that's an epic. If you can have that kind of faith and that kind of um, continuation of, of, of contribution to your, your, your policy portfolio, that's awesome. I mean, you're going to do as that over 40 years. As long as you're not years. building on expectations that the yes. we saw over the last 10 years is going to be the norm, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So if you can have that discipline, and that's probably one of the things that, that Bogle did best. He created a cult, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and, and they are, they were die hard to that. And, you know, from 2000 to 2012 was a little rough and, you know, from, you know, eight to today, it's been pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is definitely, um, uh, heightened because of the market that said, um, I think. I think one thing you will see, and we talked about this when we on where I was on your Resolve podcast, is that I think you will see things that can uh, provide diversification somewhat meet the Vanguard effect, and so people can sort of try to have their cake and eat it too. Agreed. But as we said, mm -hmm. a rent tech is never lowering their fees, and that's that. And there will always be room for those kind of companies. But I think, um, you know, a run of the mill um, alt maker or a commodity strategist. I think there's probably room to, um, you know, uh, lower cost or be the low cost provider or one of them for something that is providing diversification. Um, Vanguard does have a market neutral fund, I believe, or a couple alts, but they're, I don't think they're, I don't think their hearts in it. Um, but um, because as we said in 2000, small cap value was great, but there is a Vanguard small cap value ETF, VBR. Yep. So some of these areas you the you can find in ETF format, just not not all of them, and nothing nothing beyond just beta. What for where that market is, right. you're not going to yeah. get like Vanguard. They do have active funds, but anyway, that's uh, I I yeah I agree with you. I I do think there's uh, I there is a cult like aspect. I mean the Bogleheads are yeah they're, it, they're almost like um we call it missionaries. Yeah, but it's what makes it hard, right? The the VR VBR. Right. So VBR, VBR, yeah, I would imagine has largely been excluded from most of the 60, 40 right? It, oh it's, yeah. It's largely been excluded. Now, if we gone yeah. back to 2000, it hadn't been largely excluded. So right. there, there is still this, this performance chasing that can, can heighten fund flows. 
across whatever it's whether it's yeah. BlackRock or Vanguard. I, I think something that that you've reiterated many times is, hey, listen, in the absence of value, price matters, and the lowest cost producer in the absence of value is yes, the winner. Yes. And yes. and they and they absolutely commoditized beta or have yes. across many uh, many domains. And so now yes. when you're so now you have to think of what's my beta mix, which is a whole yeah. different, not beta max. It's my beta mix <laughs> and is a whole different sort of mindset to sort of think about as an advisor who's advising on, you know, portfolios, uh, because the, the commodity itself of betas is, is for lack of a better word free. Yeah. Yeah. And like we said before, um, people who shop at Amazon, which is almost all of us, we don't yeah. get everything from Amazon. I mean, right. we definitely go and certain things we pay up for. I think that that'll be the same. My metaphor I use in the book is the airline industry where you have three carriers with 75% market share, and then you have 25%, which is doing unique things, you know, Hawaiian airlines or whatever, private jets. Um, I just think a lot of industries move to that, that sort of model of a big three or four and then niche providers on the outside. I think that's where we're going. Now, I, I know we're a little bit time constrained today, so I want to respect that. Is there anything that's a hot topic on your list of things to cover on the book that we haven't asked about, Eric? Because I want to make sure that we hit the high points in your mind. Um, no, not really. I mean, I think um, one of the things that in, I try to explore in the book is the fall and rise of active. And I think, um, as we sort of talked about, um, if Vanguard is the core, people will be looking for things that are different. and this idea of complementing them um, and will be a lot, I think, easier than competing. Um, as you said, it'd be like trying to compete against Amazon and you're this small startup. I mean, it's gonna be tough. Um, so I, that's a really, I think, part of the book where I I think I try to progress this idea. Because you think, part of it is like, okay, Bogle Vanguard. When I was writing the book, I'm like, okay, people know him, it's low cost, indexing, wow, well, whatever. <laughs> So I worked hard to not only with those 50 voices, but with just how the ripple effects are in trading and they're in um, how active is changing and the portfolios are changing, um, how index has been evolved to become active. Um, you know, the index is now a vehicle which you could serve active. And so um, I think that's something I just want to stress to, uh, to people listening is that I tried my hardest also tried to make it not boring. I mean, we're talking mutual funds, which is like C-SPAN to most people. So I, I went above and beyond to try to spice it up and to look at the impact going forward um, of this company. I look at the international markets and what's going on over there and just try to take you through all these little wor worlds like a tour guide. And I'm explaining the world to you at the same time I'm explaining Vanguard's effect in that world or low cost effect in that world. And that was really my goal. Um, uh, you know, again, whether I pulled it off or not, it, uh, but I, I left it all in the field. Um, but I think that active thing is probably something not in other books on this. They're probably just like, oh, active is awful and Vanguard is better and they leave it at that. But what I'm noticing in the flows is people are looking for active. They're just looking for it to be complementary. And I think that's, a, that's I think we're going to see more of that, which is why I think um, themes and as silly as they are or arc, I think they, they have... They're in, a, they're in a lane that's that's going to surprise people because as long as you're not in Vanguard's domain um, and you provide it something that's complimentary, even entertaining, um, I I just think that's that's going to have a bright future. And it's it's ironic that you know Kathy Wood is benefiting from John Bogle's work and thematic <laughs> ETFs, which drove yeah. him crazy, are actually benefiting from the Bogle effect. So there's a lot of ironies in the book, especially also that Bogle helped launch some of these ETFs, like the value ETF, the growth. He had a theme ETF. And then it, later in life, he just <laughs> shits on all of them. <laughs> so he would he would constantly dump on <clears throat> stuff that he innovated on. Yeah. So, I, you know, I mean, he was pretty equal opportunity and he blames himself. I mean, he's not like, he's like, I did it. And, I, you know, I was an idiot for doing it. And, um, but I think, again, I think, um, that's why like the effect of it isn't just low cost. It's once you take over a big chunk of the portfolio, it, you know, things move. Active has to get more active. And anyway, I just wanted to sort of share that just to sort yeah. of say that there's other things in the book besides like the index fund or whatever. I yeah. worked don't, hard to not make it just that. <laughs> don't be a closet indexer. Be significantly different. Offer something, a value proposition that is way outside the commoditization. Exactly. Zone. Just pretend like there's a Walmart in town and you, what can yeah. they not get at Walmart? 
Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty good place to wrap. What do you guys think? I'm looking forward to reading it. When, when does it come out and uh, it for sale? Um, well, it's for sale now on Amazon. It comes out April right. 26th. Oh, you can pre-order so it now. If you That's order right. it now, you probably yeah. get it at the end of, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not for a month. It's ranking high in baseball biographies, which I have no idea how it got in there. My guess is, cause I, I, th I thought about it. I think, I think the reason it made it into baseball biographies in terms of like top new releases is that I com I compare his focus on cost to Saber metrics. I also, I, I use Babe Ruth when I'm talking about arc, it's a Babe Ruth yeah. active, which is like swing for the fences. And then I have this metaphor on index investing, which is like locking in a double. So I, I have a couple of baseball men. I'm maybe the algo search the book and there was enough. And you got Michael <laughs> Lewis, <laughs> right? And you've got, you've... I don't know. Anyway. Oh, so, so once funny. you do the, once you do the yeah. saber thing, it's like, it's over, man. That, that, yeah, that group it's over. just descends on it. They're, they're, <laughs> they'll digest that in a minute. But yeah, no, I'm ahead of Paul O'Neill. Uh, so I got that going for me. Oh. <laughs> Remember that guy from the Yankees? Epic. Yeah. yeah. I think he wrote a biography. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least for now, maybe next week he'll overtake the best it. Is anyway. the, the, I'm the C-SPAN of, uh, <laughs> mutual funds are the C-SPAN of, uh, they are. media. The word just Fun makes people yeah. fall asleep. They get drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> true story. True story. So, uh, well, where else can they find you? Uh, they can find the um, Bogle effect on Amazon and, uh, where else can they find, uh, Eric Twitter? I'm active on there at Eric Balchunas, uh, yep. trillions, which is a, on podcast. That's free. It's a, uh, we, a, every twice a month I do that. And then on, if you Google ETF IQ, I do a TV show that's once a week and they have the clips there if you wanted to watch something. So those are free ways. If you have a terminal, obviously you can go to BI space ETF, go to see our research. Uh, but those are the, are the basically uh, no cost awesome. ways to get me. Fantastic. Okay. Eric, well, thank, great, you. Guys, thank you for the invite.